So then, who exactly are we talking about when we talk about refugees? Is it all people who have been forced to flee their homes? Refugees who've left their countries? Is it migrants in search of a better future? Asylum seekers, perhaps? Well, let's look at the facts and figures. 68.5 million people worldwide are displaced right now. Me, I'm one of them. For perspective, that's more than the entire population of the UK. 44,400 people every day, 31 every minute, one every two seconds risk their lives to flee and find safety. 68% of the world's refugee community is made up of people from countries like Syria, South Sudan, Myanmar, Somalia, and my birthplace, Afghanistan. Those countries make up less than 2% of the global population. And despite headlines like these, refugees often flee to nearby countries rather than go to Europe or the United States. Actually, Turkey, Pakistan, Uganda and Lebanon accept a lot more of them. Millions just waiting for the chance to restart their lives. Every year, there are more and more refugees and fewer places willing to take them in. The numbers, as you just heard, keep growing every single day. In this debate, though, we are talking about the 25 million refugees who've been forced to leave their country. It's a figure that is constantly going up. Just look at what's going on today in Venezuela. With us today, we have three prominent speakers with three very different perspectives on how to tackle, how to solve this issue. Each one of them gets five minutes to do that. And I can assure you, we will strictly enforce these five minutes, gently but strictly. So if any of you hear music creeping up or music or my footsteps, you'll know it's time to stop. Let's begin with our first speaker. Mark Lamont Hill is a professor of media studies in the US. He's an author and an activist. Our second speaker will be Douglas Murray. He's a British journalist, author, political commentator. We'll hear from Muzun al Melehan after both these experts. She has fled her war-torn country at the age of 14. She now lives and studies in the United Kingdom. We also have one other person here who you've just heard from briefly. Uh, she is someone whose task will be to listen very closely to all three different positions and to try to bridge the divide to come up with any common ground. We're calling her our connector. Her name is Sanam Naragi Anderlini. She's Iranian by birth. She went to the UK in 1979 after the revolution in Iran as an 11-year-old with her family who sought political asylum. Sanam has been a peace strategist for more than two decades. She's an author and consultant to the United Nations on women in conflict. She's the founder and executive director of an NGO that advises and supports women peace activists around the world. We cannot let the next decade or even the next year of our lives be defined either by the violence of non-state or state-led extremists. Please welcome Sanam Naragi Andalini. Okay. Salam, it's great to have you with us uh, in this new role. Uh, you know firsthand what it's like to have to leave your country as a child, to try to fit in in a new foreign country, in a new society, to also try to build bridges. Given the extraordinarily strong emotions and arguments on both sides of the divide, um, how easy will it be to, to find any commonality, to bridge any kind of divide, do you think, tonight? I'm not sure how easy it will be, but it's necessary, because the problem is urgent. Every day that kids are out of school, it's a day that their life is put on hold. Um, it's a day that it means that we're not really fulfilling their potential. So uh, we ha the, the problems are complicated, the solutions will be complicated, and I hope that right. I can contribute. And let's not heighten the expectations. I don't think anyone here, I hope no one here expects us to solve this issue right here and now. But where will we know that we might have succeeded in our discussion? How far do we have to move the needle in either direction? I think, I think the issue is that there are solutions, there are recommendations at least. This, this, this problem is not new. Um, people in the field of humanitarian and peacebuilding world have long come up with ideas uh, about what could be done differently. And so what I would like to see is that the audience and, and the Twitter followers and our speakers, we actually take into account 
what's been said and echo that more broadly, in a sense, but also to see whether we can shift our own attitudes. And to come with an open mind, as you say, you're an opinionated activist, but coming with a clean slate, hopefully, ready to take notes and see what we can do to connect the line. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Sanam. You. I'll invite you to take your seat on the front Thank row. You. We'll hear from you shortly. But first off, let's go to our first speaker, Mark Lamont Hill, an academic and award-winning journalist. Mark is a professor of media at Temple University in Philadelphia. He's the author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller, Nobody, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable. Mark Lamont Hill, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening to everyone here and watching around the world. Uh, I'm excited to discuss this critical topic around the global refugee crisis. As a trained academic, however, I can't just answer a question. I have to say all the things that are wrong with the question before I can answer it. And for me, the question of refugee crisis in the global landscape is itself misleading and problematic. To talk about refugees as a crisis is to ask the wrong question at the wrong time. Rather than beginning with the entirely reasonable question of what do we do with these people who have arrived here, we must first ask an equally reasonable but far more urgent question. What are the social, cultural, economic, and intellectual conditions that led these people to our doors? Before we deliberate about what to do with Mexicans at the southern U.S. border, many of whom assume a de facto refugee status, we must instead consider the trade agreements and exploitative labor practices that actively undermine the possibility of prosperity within Mexico. Prior to wrestling with the question of Syrian refugees, we have to answer the years of American foreign policy, and we have to consider the years of American foreign policy that have helped to destabilize the region. By framing the issue differently, we not only become more intellectually honest, but we're also better equipped to arrive at sustainable solutions. We must address the crisis of citizenship. Today, we very easily and comfortably talk about our respective countries as our homes. We decide, based on the arbitrarily defined borders of the country, who is and who isn't a member of our national community. It's important to remember, however, that the idea of the nation state is a relatively new one. Prior to the last 150 years or so, our determinations of what made people, who we never actually meet in real life, part of the same community as us, were far more fluid, far more complicated. The difference between us and them, which is so often appealed to when rejecting refugees, is often, though not always, as large as we'd like to believe. To solve the refugee issue, we must first commit to reimagining citizenship in more interesting, dynamic, and practical ways. We must also consider the crisis of memory. Far too often, the people clamoring to close the borders forget that they themselves were beneficiaries of openness, either as former refugees or otherwise desperate immigrants looking for new possibilities in a new land. Rather than closing the door behind us once we've safely passed through the door, we must do the difficult but necessary work of creating sites of safety for those who come after us. We must remember who we are. We must also remember the horrors that have occurred when we have failed to properly tend to refugees. Consider, for example, in the, in the 1930s, when the U.S. and Europe refused to provide refugee status to Jewish brothers and sisters, desperately fleeing Nazi Germany. Our moral failure contributed to one of the greatest atrocities in human history. We cannot repeat such acts of moral indifference and outright evil by failing to remember our mistakes. Speaking of mistakes, we must take seriously the question and the crisis of supremacy. Simply put, we live in a world where we believe that some lives are inherently worth more than others. This belief, undergirded by white supremacy, Orientalism, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism, allows us to view some lives as worthy of protection and others as disposable. It allows us to see some cultures as compatible with our society and others as an inherent threat to our way of life. This doesn't mean that there aren't real and tangible political and cultural differences that we must consider. We must do that. But even those differences can't be properly understood or reckoned with until we address our core biases. And speaking of biases, we must tackle the crisis of representation, particularly in the media. The media, both traditional and new forms, offers most citizens their window into the human experience. The media shapes how we identify and assess social problems. The media gives us a sense of what our available solutions are. The media tells us whose lives matter 
and whose don't. As long as we are beholden to a narrow range of corporate media sources, themselves committed to a narrow range of ideas and shot through with the very biases that I just referred to, we will struggle to think outside the constraints of the current moment. So what do we do? The million dollar question that all academics hate to answer. We must resist. We must address each of these crises with the belief that organized people can and do defeat organized power. That means we vote, we march, we think, we boycott, we teach, we write, we sing, we debate, all in ways that undermine the current power structure and create the possibility for freedom and safety for refugees around the world. Thank you so very kindly. Mark Clement Hill, thank you very much for keeping it very direct, very concise. You bring up a host of very interesting, valid issues, but I heard a lot of grievances, a lot of let's go back into our past, let's not forget our history. But what is the workable solution you are suggesting? Because to me, to others perhaps, it may sound like a little bit of a utopian worldview that you hold. There is a certain reality today, is there not, that we all must exist within? You can't just say we don't want to have borders. We don't want to over-obsess about the, the idea of borders. Let's move, let's move past this, can you? Is that realistic? Can, not the former, but the latter, absolutely. We can acknowledge the moment and say we have borders. We can't pretend we don't. But we can not obsess about borders. We can reimagine ourselves as part of a global community rather than exclusively a national community. What I'm calling for is a set of public policies that aren't beholden purely to the boundaries of the nation state. Yes, but you are, you are ignoring, aren't you, a good chunk of any given population, not just those in Europe who are increasingly anti-immigrant or who want to close their doors to this uh, massive exodus of refugees as they see it, though it's gone down in the last couple of years. But yeah. what about what's going on on the other side of the Atlantic? Where both both you and I live. You've got people who echo Trump's worldview and want, in fact, not just to see borders, they want to see a wall. Absolutely. What do you say to them? I think that's part of the resistance point that I spoke to. Teaching is a form of resistance. Writing is a form of resistance. Representing is a form of resistance would allow people to have access to data that shows that many of their fears and many of the moral panics that are assigned to the immigration crisis and the refugee crisis are, in fact, not founded in any, any data. The fear that they're going to come and become terrorists is not founded by any sort of data. Uh, the idea that they're going to destroy the economy is undermined well, by any it economic It may not violence. be, but it is, as you say, it is shaping the mindset, isn't it? I yeah. just want to show you an incident that actually took place on the U.S.-Mexico border and, and get your take on it, Absolutely. just to show the extent of the emotions that yeah. you find on this issue. Let's go to it. Get So again, these are not manufactured. These are strong, palpable emotions <laughs> yes. that perhaps reflect the base maybe that got Trump to the White House to begin with, this issue of immigration, which is a major concern for a lot of people. Uh, no doubt politicians have exploited it too. Again, the question, by being too much of a humanist, are you actually not surrendering the argument to the opposing camp? Are you not being a little bit too overly uh, optimistic and simplistic? I, I would say no, because my optimism is anchored in action. I don't think we can just be optimistic. That image right there is eerily reminiscent of the 1960s, where people didn't want to integrate lunch counters. They didn't want black people in the United States to have the right to vote. And if you were to put those things to a popular poll at the time, Black equal rights would have lost, sure. and yet we still found a way to marshal our resources to win. I'm saying we can. But this do is the reality. How do you yes. change? How do you change the narrative, though, given this political reality? And, and that's why I went back to the media representation point. We have to tell different stories. If we only tell the story of the one in a million people who engage in, in these acts that we are so terrified of, but instead don't talk about the people who, over 20 years, outstrip. Uh, the economic resources that they took from the, from the nation and actually earn more and contribute more. If we show that people are not an actual terror, if we show that long term they contribute and create jobs, if we show long term the value that we have to the global community, uh, I, I think we win that argument, not in the short term, but in the long term. But in the short term, sometimes we need public policy that doesn't go with the sentiments of that person at the border. And we'll certainly talk about the role of the media as well. For now, Mark Clement Hill, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
Now, if Mark Lamont's Hill's take was all about resisting and pushing back, let's hear from Douglas Murray. What does he think needs to happen in order to best address this issue? Douglas is an award-winning British journalist. He's also the author of The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam. Douglas Murray, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you here in Doha. Uh, I've been traveling across several continents in recent years, not just to the countries that people are fleeing from around the world, but also to the places they're fleeing to, to the refugee camps, migrant camps that people end up in. And I've been struck by so many thoughts during this time, but one of them is that there are so many utopian dreams that occur. People dream that you could live in a borderless world on one hand. Other people pretend you could just stop anyone coming. These are impossible dreams, but somewhere in the middle of them is something we need to aim for. And one of the ways I've started to realize that we need to think about this is in the following terms, not about right or wrong or you know, good and bad, uh, I'm a good person, you're a Nazi, it's too easy. What we need to think about with this is that we're in a situation with migration talking about competing virtues. There are two virtues in this whole debate that are in serious competition, not just between people, but within all of us. The first virtue, I would say, is the virtue of mercy, the desire to be merciful to our fellow human beings who are suffering. And we all feel that. Everybody should feel that. But there is also another virtue here, the virtue of justice. And that's not just justice for people fleeing countries, but justice for people in the countries that they are fleeing to. And we can't ignore those two parts. We need to recognize that's what's going on here. This is why it's so difficult, and the debate goes down the middle of all of us. So look, there are so many questions we need to think about if we're going to address this. And I'm so glad, by the way, this isn't a debate, because this is a very not debatable issue but why we need to think about this. Let me give you just six examples of things we need to think about much more deeply than we have. The first is this. I would suggest it is very obvious that the developing world cannot move to the developed world. So what do we do? Who can come? That's one quest part of that question. And the second part, which is much harder, who can't? We are very, very bad at having even a bit of that debate, but we need to. Secondly, what are the differences between people fleeing for their lives from a war zone and people fleeing serious, severe economic deprivation in, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa? Now, there are differences, but if you recognize that, then you've got to work out where along the way you would put your line for legitimate asylum claims. Th a third of people in sub-Saharan Africa polled last year by Gallup said they wanted to move and leave sub-Saharan Africa. So you've got to work out along this way, if you're going to have a sustainable asylum policy, who qualifies for it. And I would suggest we're not very good at having that discussion either. A third point. We know that some cultures find it easier to mix into other cultures than others, but we don't know exactly how. And we don't know what the proportions of people are in another culture that work well, integrate well, adapt well, and what the proportions are that start to make that integration, that adaptation far harder. We have thought very little about this, and what thinking there has been has been pretty bad. Let me give you another example of something we need to think about. How do we deal with a question this serious in the age of social media? An age when a single photograph of a single person can go all around the world, and everybody sees it, and everybody says something must be done. And their politicians think, I've got to do something. And then they do something, and the public say, no, that wasn't the something we were thinking of. We've thought of something else, but we don't know what. How do we live in that world? How do politicians act in that world? How do we have any form of political leadership in that world? How do we work out what the right thing to do is in that world? Not just in the short term, but in the long term too. I'll give you a fifth question. How do we ensure that we're able to have a serious and deep debate about these issues and that we're able to allow people to express legitimate concerns and have that debate without those legitimate concerns being dismissed as xenophobic, nativist, and so on. How do we work out where that might be the case? And how do we work out where it's not, where there are legitimate fears? Sixth question, how do we overcome fatalism? The fatalism you hear everywhere these days, sometimes in the spirit of optimism. This is the world as it is now. People move. This is globalization. Get used to it. Suck it up. Don't complain. How do we get used to that? How do we deal with that? Now, I've got, rather unsurprisingly, fewer answers than I've got questions. But let me give you just three answers I would suggest that we could hold on to as the beginning of a set of answers to this. The first is, 
hold a very clear line between people fleeing for their lives from war zones and people fleeing economic deprivation. Find and hold to a very clear line on it. If you do not, I predict with absolute certainty that you will continue to erode public sympathy with people who need the sympathy the most because these things will be rubbed together and elided. So, how, so I would suggest, first of all, find that and hold on to it pretty close. Second thing I would suggest, find a broad level of agreement, and there is a lot of this internationally now, that the best way to cope with the most serious situations is to keep people roughly in the area of the country for which they fled. It's much easier to look after them there. It's much easier to get international aid there. My own country, Great Britain, is, I think, the second largest donor of international aid within the regions of Syria. That should, I think, be one of the models for this, that we, we make sure that people... We don't have this idea that some people have that you disperse X percentage there and X percentage there and put these people there. Thirdly, I would say, make sure you increase economic productivity in refugee camps. Make sure people have a hope and a purpose and a work life when they're outside of their country. Look, I'm concluding with this, because otherwise the music will get so loud you won't hear me. There are no simple answers to this because there are no simple questions in this. This whole business does not give itself to sound bites, but it does need a much deeper debate than most of us have been willing to have so far. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Douglas Murray, thank you very much. A few provocative thoughts, no doubt, that you mentioned there. A few jumped at me, such as when you said, the developing world cannot move to the developed world. You seem to conveniently forget that the developed world moved to the developing world without asking permission. No, I don't. That, I don't. It, it seems to me as well that this is a particularly Western-centric view viewpoint and a misleading one at that, because you know as well as I do, and the figures show it, 85% of the world's refugees, in fact, settle in neighboring countries mm. in the Middle East, sure. in Africa, in Asia. They do not rush over to Europe. Sure. Uh, I, you'd make a big mistake if you think I hadn't heard of colonialism. Mm. Um, you don't and seem I to address also, it in and any I'd way. also suggest, by the way, that it's, 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 it, I don't know how long we're going to go on about colonialism for. I'm happy to do it as long as you like. But, but let don't me we just have to be factful, though. About well, don't we have to be? But also, don't think, it, about don't facts, think, if I may history. say so, that colonialism was just a Western thing. What was one of the largest and most significant empires in history? But the Ottoman Empire. Do we say that Turkey has to do something like the West to deal with That's this? That's not the issue. You well, are you brought up colonialism. You, you are talking about the Western view that they should stay where they belong. I'm saying that it's, it seems to me to be much wiser that if you have a very large humanitarian crisis in, for instance, Syria, you try to make sure that people remain in the area. This isn't say all of them, but, they do. but it is more likely... I, I absolutely agree they, they do. do. I've I mean, seen look, it look firsthand. At Turkey, what 3. I'm 5 million refugees. Look at Lebanon and Jordan per capita. What the I'm suggesting that have the most. to you is... In fact, in Lebanon, you've got one in every four person living in that country is absolutely. a Syrian refugee. Absolutely. So to suggest what they're not doing very much is just being misleading, believe being me, dishonest. Believe me, I'm not being misleading. And I said from the outset that I agree with the point that most refugees remain in the area. And I said that I think that that's a good idea. I'm suggesting to you that I think it's better that people, for instance, fleeing Syria, end up in the countries around Syria in order to be able to return to their country than putting them in but Norway. But they won't return. You are suggesting that they don't want to return. Who in their right mind, if they, they had the option... I'm not suggesting they don't want to return. When did I say that? hear from a refugee, if they had the option to return, of course they'd want to return. I didn't home. say they wouldn't. They leave everything behind. But you seem to also be oblivious to another important fact that I just want to throw at you before we go to a video clip that I want to show you. It's what about the moral responsibility, though, of Western countries that have contributed to the destabilization of the region, the meddling, the military interventions, not to mm -hmm. mention the arms sales that continue as we speak. Mm -hmm. What about that? Do you that want me to answer that? Okay. Okay, I'll answer that one frankly. Uh, nobody denies, for instance, the disaster of Iraq, but who are the people who intervened most in it Syria? Isn't just hang on, hang on. Let me answer it. Who intervened most in Syria? It wasn't America, it wasn't Britain. It's Iran, Russia. It's, among others, countries, including the one we're in and others you're, you're around deflecting. the Gulf before, here. Before we got to Let's Syria, we had, it, Iraq, we had Libya, we had many Countries many in this neck of the woods were much more involved in the Syrian civil war than my country was. Well, you're also so do you want to take some responsibility for that? Do you think, want to take think, more refugees here can, in Qatar? Do you want to take around. more in the Gulf? No one right. is immune to any sort of criticism. But, so, well, but we're talking about glad to hear the Western it. countries, the British countries, uh, the British countries. What did Britain do in Syria? We're talking about these governments that you seem to suggest 
should be immune no, or when should did I be suggest that? absolved of any responsibility. When did I suggest that? I want to get to the other point that you make, and it's an important one, Douglas Murray. You suggest that we need to actually balance between two very important mm. virtues, two important concepts mm. of mercy toward the refugee and justice toward your sure. own citizens. Let's take a quick look at this instance involving refugees. Do you think anyone for us? We are the Syrians. Sir, uh, I give you the number of mouth uh, authority because you are near mouth. Hello? Yes. About 100 children and 100 women and uh, and one and uh, maybe 100 men. Please hurry. Water is uh, coming into it. The boat is going down. We are dying. 300 yes, you children. Are, you are have dying. called Malta. You have called Malta. Don't throw us. You can run away. Call Malta, call Malta. I, I have no enough account on the mobile if you cut, please. You yes. have my number now. You call me you, please. A very chilling video, though I don't suggest that you um, respond on behalf of the Coast Guard, the Italian Coast Guard. But again, it's that same issue of shifting the, the problem to others. And just for a little bit of context, in fact, this boat, which capsized five hours after this call, killing quite a few people on board, we heard that there were about 100 women, 100 children on board, uh, that was twice as close to an Italian island as it was to Malta. But again, this idea that, you know, we have to safeguard our values, where does mercy fit in that? Not just mercy, but the obligation, well, the legal obligations of states to refugees. Suggest, I'd suggest that we all make sure we don't shift responsibility. Uh, there is a responsibility to everyone. That would include the state we're standing in now, wouldn't it? It would include all the states in this region. It would include the brother states. It would include the Ummah. It would include everybody. It wouldn't just be the Italians. Now, the Italians, by the way, and I, let me just finish uh, this that's point. That's a valid, the valid Italians, issue. Let me respond to it. Let me, because let me you finish the, the point. Of the, because the, region, the Italians, it's a valid issue. But the unlike the European let countries, me allow me to point. just make this point. And like the point. European countries, I'll respond to two they, points, they are not parties to the 1951 Refugee Convention. So Conveniently. The obligations are, well, it's just a fact. Conveniently, isn't but it? But I'll let you carry on. It's but this means that countries that are signatories the refugee convention get more blame and more assumption that they are going to have to hold more of the burden than countries that didn't. And I'm choice. suggesting to you that nobody should be, uh, should be able to absolve themselves from blame. But if you go to Italy now, and I don't know when you were last there, but it is not the case that this is going well in Italy, either for the migrants who are arriving or for the Italian population. But isn't it because you don't the resources see these people are not being poured out. into this? Let's face it, the policies are not there, the resources aren't there. I, I see about the these people numbers. when they arrive, I follow their stories. They, they, this is not, it is not the case just that they don't you know, the, 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 local, the local populations in Italy have I've been to Lampedusa, I've seen the boats coming in. The local populations are extremely generous, they are extremely kind to the people. Most of the populations in Europe, let's just not have this idea that Europeans are somehow incredibly cold hearted. No, Countries no in Europe have that, taken in a lot of people and they are trying to deal with a very big problem very well, swiftly. We're just putting the numbers in context, let me just mention sure. this very briefly. Three million people sought asylum in Europe between 2015 and 2016. That's mm -hmm. a fraction of the population of Europe, which is 508 sure. million. And uh, Germany and Sweden took in 3% uh, of the population in one year alone. So we're not talking about so negligible numbers, and no, you shouldn't pretend that we are. Not across the board, certainly. Douglas sure. Murray, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. All right. This is where hopefully we'll have less uh, pull and push. We have with us someone who has lived through it all, someone who can present to us what it means to be a refugee. Muzun al Malehan is a refugee from Syria. After, after the outbreak of the civil war there, she fled with her family to neighboring Jordan and went from one camp to the other. She was just 14 years old at the time. Muzun now lives and studies, as I said earlier, in the United Kingdom. Muzun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm so pleased to be, of course, in Dauha and to be debating uh, with you this evening. Uh, you know, education gives hope. And let me start with a question, which is, I think, really important, which makes us to think practical rather than rational this time. Be honest. Would you be able and go and live for a month in a refugee camp without any advanced facilities, such as without electricity, without internet, like millions of refugees who are living in dreadful situations 
worldwide. Please think about it deeply, and I will ask you about it later. But now I would like to tell you my own story of becoming a refugee. In 2013, I had to flee my home with my family and to go to live in refugee camps in Jordan, Zaatari camp. And for me, and of course for my family, that was the hardest choice in our lives. Even the situation was really difficult in Syria, but we didn't want to flee because we love our country and we wanted to stay there. But as you know, when there is war, there is no future. There is no life. So we had to flee and leave everything behind. Before the war, we had a normal life, like all of you. We had home, friends, education, and everything we needed. And most importantly, safety. But when the war started, our lives have changed upside down. That's why millions of Syrians had to flee their homes. So we have become refugees. For me, when I arrived to Zaatari camp, that was really difficult. I was so sad. I was crying because it was different and weird. It is completely different where I have come from. We had so many challenges. For example, we lived in a tent. One tent, a small tent, you have to do everything in one tent, like sleeping, eating, welcoming visitors, and do everything, basically. Share your kitchen with so many people who you don't know them. And these are, uh, you know, private things that you have to share it with so many people. Bringing water from a distant place. As Muzun, I have grown up, and I love education so much. Education is a fundamental part of my life. It means so much to me. I cannot live without education. Because I believe without education, I cannot do anything in my life. I cannot achieve anything. And I cannot be a good person to my society and to myself. So my only concern was about education. I was thinking if I can find a school in the camps. And once I found it, I found hope. But unfortunately, I saw so many refugees. And of course, because they had so many difficult experiences, they lost hope. And they felt it is not important for us to be educated. But at that moment, I felt there is a responsibility. As I believe education is important for me, I believe it is important for each individual who is outside Syria right now and has an opportunity to go and be educated, they must Use those opportunities and be educated. Because without education, that would be disasters. Not only for my own country, but for the whole world. Without education, we cannot achieve anything in our lives. So that's how we started being an activist, going from tent to tent, convincing people to be educated and to have their knowledge and to have access to their rights. Do you know why? Because it is not our fault. I didn't make the war. I was just 13. Even when the war started, I was 10 or 11 years old. So I didn't want to see my country to be destroyed. Syria means so much to me. I can go back today before tomorrow if the situation would be better. If we could access our rights again and we, uh, we will be able to have you know, our full rights and to have safety, of course. But sometimes you are forced to. Unfortunately, most of us think about refugees just as numbers. But behind each number, there is a story of hope or maybe sufferings. But all those people are human beings like all of us. But the difference that you label you as citizens and they label us as refugees, that our circumstances are different. Why we label them and sometimes judge them in a negative way at the time those people want hope. They fled difficult situations just because they believe in a better life and to build a better future for them and their children. That's why I fled my home. Not because I don't like my homeland. I have never ever thought I will leave my country. I love it so much, but I had to. It wasn't my choice. So. 
My story is only millions of stories of those refugees who we have to think about them deeply and just know the reality. And what we have to do is to know about refugees as individuals and those people who can do something. So please use your advantage, circumstances to help them reach them out and to try to give them hope and opportunities. Push your governments and uh, let them welcome those refugees. And I believe that international community and pol uh, policy makers can do so much because they have the resp uh, responsibility too. Thank you. Rather than talking about refugees as numbers, let's talk about them as, uh, as human beings. And there is an unchangeable fact that we all are human beings and we deserve the best. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Muzun, uh, telling us what it is really like for you, because as I say, we are used to speaking about this, sh this issue without ever having been in your shoes or the shoes of refugees. I know when you left your home and you said more than once, you did everything you could not to leave. Of the few precious belongings you could take, you in fact chose to take books. Mm -hmm. How empowered has that made, made you feel? Do you feel that in addition to being a statistic, a security burden to some, there's also the social dimension of things in that if refugees were more highly skilled, better educated, they'd mm -hmm. be more welcomed. This is such an important uh, question. Thank you so much. You know, at the moment that we had to flee Syria, my dad just asked us actually to carry the most important stuff because you have to walk uh, for a few hours and you cannot carry, you know, everything you have in your homeland. So at that moment, I thought about the most important thing uh, in my life and I realized it is education. I was so sad to leave my school and everything, but I said these books might be my hope in my new homeland, which is the camp. And today, just very briefly, if we can, uh, your life in Newcastle in the UK, you You've settled in, you've, mm -hmm. uh, you fit in a multicultural setting, at least within your own school, is my understanding, when you were, mm -hmm. when you were stu studying there. To what extent do you feel that those people relating to you in a Western city like this are able to look past your hijab, look past your ethnicity, ethnicity your culture, to see you really for the human being that you say you need to be looked at mm -hmm. as? As a person, I believe that uh, humanity has so many in common uh, rather than differences. So I, I believe that our differences can teach us so much. Like we are not all uh, have the same things, the same belief, the same culture, the same religion, the same nationality or races, but we all have something in common, which is the humanity and the emotions that we all share. So I feel I can learn from them and they can learn from me as well. That's a great message on, on which to end. Thank you very much. We'll be, of course, opening the discussion in our Majlis in a few moments, mm -hmm. but for now, Muzun al Melehan. No, thank, thank you very much you. indeed. So, before we bring in the audience, before we bring in all of you and those of you following us online, let's quickly see where we stand. Let me just very briefly summarize all three positions, if I can. Mark Lamont Hill earlier speaking to us about the need to resist power structures and to push back. Douglas Murray says, we need to keep in mind that there are two competing virtues. He says, keep justice and mercy in balance. And you just heard from Muzu, and for her, it's all about education. Education being the weapon, the tool, education bringing hope to refugees. Now is your chance to weigh in on the statements you just heard here and online. As I say, just go to dohadebate.com.vote. You each have 100 points at your disposal. You can assign them to the speaker of your choice. You can choose one, you can choose two or three, and divide the points up as you wish. Uh, please start by allocating your points now, if you can. In the meantime, Nelufar, tell us what is going on online, what the reactions have been so far. Rida, thank you very much. Yes, people are definitely sharing their thoughts with me on Twitter. Uh, I've got a lot to get through here, but before we do, it's important to hear uh, what you guys think and the vote as is being cast in this room and online. As Rida mentioned, Doha Debates 
facebook.com forward slash vote. But I want to know your opinions and thoughts about the compelling argument that our panellists have made. What do you think? Do you agree or disagree? What's really got to you? Uh, and what are you hoping uh, will be said going on? I just want to read you a couple of the tweets that we've had so far. So we've got one from Rurur, uh, and he says, hashtag Dear World, stop judging those who forcibly had to seek refuge in your country. The refugee crisis should be viewed and dealt with from a completely different angle by governments and citizens of host countries. And then there's another perspective here, Reda, offered by Stephen Eckner. He says, borders are not arbitrary. They are the result of somewhat contingent historical processes. These define national identities on which the social cohesion of the nation depends. Changing these should be done with great prudence. So in a way, echoing a lot of what uh, Douglas Murray has said. Just to remind you again, you can vote online right now. That uh, web address is dohadebatescom forward slash vote. We really want to know what you think. Which idea, which debate, which discussion uh, really moved you guys? Rida, actually, one thing that I noticed uh, on Twitter, people engaged a lot with what you said directly to Douglas Murray. Uh, I think you made the point that uh, you said you must you must be forgetting, you said, that the developed world moved into the developing world without their permission. That's uh, got a lot of tweets, uh, GIFs and memes that have been circulating online. So we've got a lot of engagement. I still want to know what you think. Twitter, hashtag Dear World. Get in touch with me and I'll read your comments online. Khida, Thanks you. so much, Nilufar. Very interesting to hear. We'll come back to you, of course, a little later. But I understand we have the results. Let's put them up and see how... The different statements have played out with our audience, both here and online. Do we have a clear winner, so to speak? Well, we've got a couple of positions. I got more than the third one. Resist power pushback. That was Mark Lemont Hill. That's almost 40% of your votes. Then education. Education, hope. Uh, what we heard from Muzun, about 34.7% of the vote. And... Uh, Keep justice and mercy in balance. Some people have bought into this argument, Douglas Murray, some haven't, as you might expect. But quite, quite a close call, though, I have to say. It wasn't like one statement or one argument won over everyone's votes. So that'll be very interesting to discuss and debate in more detail in a minute or two. Let me now bring uh, back our connector and invite her on to the stage. I know Sanam Naragi Andalini, you've been taking notes, you've been listening very closely, seeing, you know, what you can make of all these arguments and which one fit best in our world today. So let me invite you to the stage to share with us your observation. Sanam. Thank you. I was taking notes because it's hard to be the problem solver in five minutes as you're listening to people. But to begin with, I just wanted to actually acknowledge something. Um, Mazun, your story resonates with me. 40 years ago, I left with a suitcase and some school books. I thought I was going back, and I didn't go to ever live back in my own country. Um, Mark, I live in America now. I am able to travel the world because I have a British passport. Um, it confers much privilege to me, and, and I value it extraordinarily. And Douglas, I think, you know, you and I appeared in England at about the same time I appeared as an asylum seeker. You appeared as a baby in 1979. So we have that in common. But, but more than that, I think, um, as I listened to the conversations, what struck me is that so much of what you guys are now saying has been a part of the discussions out there in the world of people and in the world that I occupy in the last 22 years of people who are peace builders and humanitarian workers and relief workers. When we talk about the question of justice and mercy, um, justice for the host communities, this is not a new problem. If you were from Burundi in 1994, if you are from uh, Pakistan or Iran in the, in, when, when the, when the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan happened, the host communities have always had a challenge of what do they do with populations coming in, especially when you're poor, when the host community itself is poor as well. So I think that we have to reimagine it, as, as, Douglas as, as, uh, as Mark mentioned, and think about it this way. We spend so much money on security. We want to spend $10 billion on a wall. We put it into the security forces and the thugs and so forth to keep people out. Imagine if we actually gave incentives to host communities to host refugees so that the schools and the clinics and the education that, that Mazun is talking about actually came and was a benefit to not only the refugees, 
but also to the host communities. So thinking about it in these ways, and, and trust me, the amount of money we would have to spend on building houses and clinics and, and, and schools and roads is far less than what we're doing in terms of putting the money into walls and cages and security forces. So that, that could be one way of thinking about the justice and mercy balance. The second thing is we talk about, um, and Douglas raised this, this question of solving the problems over there. Uh, I'm in the world of peace building, and one of the things that we know is that for every $1,860 spent on defense and security, there is $1 that's spent on peace. We know that if you include women in peace processes, and, and today we, the talks are happening with the Taliban, that peace becomes much more sustainable, and yet we're not doing it. So that the solutions are out there. We need the political will and the public to actually know that there is, there is hope and, and, and there are possibilities of changing the way that, that, that we think about these. But for sure, people don't want to leave their countries. For sure, people want to return home. So if we could actually enable the peace building to happen before the conflict breaks out, the chances of, of, a, of a solution for all of us would be better. It is 60 times more cost effective, 60 times more cost effective to deal with the problem early on than to deal with the violence afterwards. Right? So again, it is possible, we just need to change the way we think about things. And then finally, um, you raise the question of who is a signatory to the Refugee Convention and so forth. I think this is a really important issue. The Refugee Convention we have goes back to the 20th century. It's from, from the end of World War I, World War II, especially um, in the 1950s. Some countries existed, some countries didn't, uh, some countries signed. Turkey, for example, recognized refugees as Europeans, because those were the refugees who came at, at the time. But they've come up with different ways of dealing with it. Some people give work permits and temporary residency. It's time for us to reimagine some of that, because again, when you seek asylum, you really can't go back to your own country. And a lot of people don't want to seek asylum. When you seek asylum, you can't work. It's absurd that you might be an engineer or a doctor, and you end up somewhere, and you can't actually practice your profession. So I, th I think that there's scope there for us to also be thinking about addressing the three, three uh, different uh, uh, points of view that we heard. And, and I just want to end on one thing. Education, education, education. Every child needs education. If I had missed a day or a month of school, I'm not sure whether I'd been, been able to go to university. So, so I think that we have to understand that this is urgent and it's critical. And all, despite all the debates, schooling must be integral to what we mean as humanitarian relief. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam. Thanks very much uh, indeed for trying to make sense of it all for us. We're going to open the floor to all of you in just a moment because this is where we arrive to the heart of our program, which is called the Majlis. This is where we all, all of us collectively, move into that solution building mode. What can we agree on? what was missing from this discussion, how can we actually move forward? We'll also be gauging the mood online with Nelufar in a moment. So we want to hear from you. Give us your ideas, your thoughts, your questions. Try to provoke some of our yes, here, our speakers to, to, to go beyond what they are suggesting, if it isn't enough, to see how each one of us who has a stake in this discussion can actually make a difference. We have two microphones on either side of the aisles. I encourage you to please line up behind these microphones if you want to ask a question. When I call on you, please give us your name and do get straight to the question if you can by being concise and brief. And I see somebody standing at the mic already. Please go ahead. Yes, my name is Kevin Campbell. Um, I agree with Mark's point about challenging power structures. And I just want to ask, um, at which point you know, do we as citizens in the world look and realize that our political leaders are the problem in the world and question them instead of having debates with students who, yes, they are future world leaders, but we have to challenge our current, you know, world leaders from America right back to China because when you look at the global landscape, they are the problem. They are okay. the ones starting the wars. They are the ones that's causing refugee crises All around right, the world. Thank you very much for that question, Mark. Uh, I think you make a... Thank you. I think you make a profound point, especially the part where you agreed with me. Um, I, I, th I think, though, I would push back just a bit and say that I'm not sure political leadership is the problem. I think they're a symptom of a problem. It's our fundamental political system. It's our fundamental relations of capital. It's our taken-for-granted assumptions about how the world should work that often shape the type of choices we make for political leadership or the types of responses we have to political leadership that we don't choose and we often in many parts of the world are forced to deal with. 
forms of political leadership that we don't choose. So for me, I think the question becomes, how can we, again, and I, and I know it be, can become a bit idealistic at times, but I think we do have to imagine new possibilities for how the world could work, whether it's borders, whether it's what economic mode of production we're going to appeal to. It's how we're going to imagine the role of one nation versus the other. It's, 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 it's about reassessing the global landscape and saying that the West can't always be the animating force behind everything that happens. I know we're gonna have a debate about that to some extent, about why that's the case. But, but I think at the very least, we have to reimagine the relationship between colonizer and colonizer, between East and West, and between even those very labels. I think in doing so, we may be able to produce new mindsets which will allow us to uh, demand different types of political leadership. Otherwise, you'll overthrow one government and replace it with another, and we've seen that story many times. Let me go to another question, if I can, and come back to our panelists. Let's get another question, but please be as brief and concise as you can be. Uh, I'm Thank, you. I'm oh. Thank you very much. I, w I shall try. Um, when I'm not in Doha, I'm dealing with refugee and humanitarian issues in crisis and conflict zones. I'll be back in Afghanistan in two weeks' time to monitor the, let's call it, so-called peace process and especially the conflict situation at the parliamentary elections. At this time, I'm totally flabbergasted that whether it's the so-called peace negotiations here taking place in Doha or those in Moscow do not agree either the government of Afghanistan, women, members of society. Peace cannot come on the basis of the Trump administration talking to the insurgency that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. So my point here is, unless, and yet that goes to all your points, unless something is done to get civil society on a much different scale and women in that, we will have a gigantic refugees crisis of another six million people pouring out of Thank Afghanistan you. from the Taliban Thank you for that takeover. question. It's about making it more inclusive. Very briefly, before we go to another question, Sanam. Thank you very much for bringing that point and, and the point about civil society. This is, this is exactly my work as well. And uh, we tried to bring 40 women to Doha to make that point this, this time. And, and unfortunately, for various reasons, they were not unable to come. We can talk about it later. Um, but I think that, that the point that you're making and, and the point of the, before, the speaker before, I think those of us who are citizens in countries where we have the right of freedom of expression have the responsibility to engage on our country's foreign and security policies. That's what I do all the time in my work. It's not easy, it's not fun, it, it's quite boring trying to deal with public policy, but it works. And the more voices we have in this space, they don't want us there. They want it to be limited. Yeah. But the more of us are actually out there addressing these things, the better it would be. And whether it's about Afghanistan or frankly, uh, in the next few months, Iran, which may be the next war that they're trying to start. So without and being biased, the more women, the better, quite often in these discussions. Another question, please. Hi, yeah, I'm Hamad Bahawash. I'm a senior at Georgetown University. And my question is to Mr. Douglas Murray. And before I ask my question, I just want to say, you said no sound bites, but then you said the developing world cannot move to the developed world. I don't know what that's about. I think about. I said it before. Uh, my question is, uh, since you brought up migration from the developing world, uh, I'd like to ask you this. Every year, the developed world sends about $300 billion of aid to the developing world, but the developing world sends back trillions in debt repayments uh, to the developed world. Now, um, don't you think that this is why, that this is the main reason why migrants are moving to Europe? Because money is moving out of the developing world. Wealth is leaving the developing world and moving to the developed world to build on what Lamont Hill said. Don't you think this is why people are moving to the Western world, to the developed world? Well, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, again, I repeat the fact there are no simple answers. And if it was simply the fact that you could, I don't know, do a debt default or something and solve the whole migration issue, then then that would be great. But it just isn't the case. You think that if, if, uh, if um, for instance, all uh, African countries were allowed to default on debt, that they'd become uh, uh, um, burgeoning, uh, flourishing uh, 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 societies? You think that the problem across, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa isn't just unbelievable greed and theft by politician after politician? You think that, that, that if you just wrote off the debt, that would stop being an issue and everyone would become transparent and clean in their dealings with money? I mean, the problems are much deeper than this. They're much deeper than just a, a simple solution like that. As, if I may just add quickly to the, the previous two uh, comments, the, the, the late, very distinguished American uh, diplomat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a, a wonderful rule he came up with, known as Moynihan's Law, where he said that, that uh, human rights, claims of human rights violations 
often happen in exactly inverse proportion to human rights violations. That is, you hear about them in the countries that are most free. And before long, you can end up with the presumption that the most free countries are the ones who are most abusive of human rights. And this happens with the case when we talk about our leaders and the ones... It's all very well. We can, we can talk about the Trump administration, we can talk about the democracies and, and so on for, for all, we, all we like. We can all make criticisms, and we all should. But, OK, Briefly. Mr Putin, what are you going to do about him? What are you going to do about the mullahs in Iran? What are you going to do about the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia? You see, what we end up with is this situation. We go, oh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump. We can all do that. Believe me, I can riff on but Trump again, all, you're being all quite day. Selective, aren't what you? are you going to do about the people you can't do anything about? Are you going to ignore them? Are you going to give them a pass? Well, or are you just going to enjoy beating well, up on the demo I, I, democracy? I hate to have to interrupt you. you. There's something called democracy, though, isn't there? Elections. For um, sure. Mark, quickly before I go to another question. No, no, no. I, I, we can go to another question. We'll, okay, we'll let's go to another question. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this is very briefly addressed to all of you. Uh, we have been, talk been talking about the role of uh, developed countries, uh, but uh, how about uh, our role? How about sustainable development? I mean, what comes after education? How do we develop those countries that we uh, that we get out from after we get the education. Why don't we have goals set for uh, what do I have to do to make my country developed? How do, how do I make my country self uh, self reliant? Uh, the, I mean, we've been talking about the role of developed countries. Why not talk about the role of devel developing countries? Thank you so much. Well I, well, I think they are in. There's a dynamic relationship between those two things. And that's why I thought the previous question was important. While I agree with you, there's no silver bullet. There's no single answer to any of this. I think it would be hard to imagine uh, any free African nation without imagining the role of structural adjustment policy, debt repayment in particular, and in particular ways that it undermines its ability to self-sustain and to self-govern. So as I, as I think about, in your question, uh, the idea that we need to pr provide a, a, a self-sustaining Qatar or a self-sustaining Uganda, I mean, pick a place, right, Tanzania. We, we, we have to understand the role of the West in, in undermining that. Otherwise, we end up with a narrative like, why don't you people just clean yourselves up and, 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 and pick yourself up by the bootstraps and, and self-govern? And I think it's a much more challenging and daunting task than that. Another question, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about you know, my mother's experience as an immigrant, and I want to touch here on something that Mark Lamont Hill said, this power of education and telling people how refugees fit into the wider context of economic development. Here's why I'm very skeptical about that. Because when my mother arrived in the UK and her parents arrived in the UK, people still called them dirty packies. When she had graduated from Oxford University, she was still a brown person who was not seen as a citizen, right? So, to what extent can we really sell this idea that being educated or fitting X, Y, and Z criteria is what you need to do as a refugee for people to humanize you? The inherent problem with these people is that they don't humanize you. You can't fulfill your oppressor's criteria so that they right. see you as human. So, so how do you humanize people? Dehumanizing refugees, thank you very much. And with this, let me go to you, uh, Douglas Murray. Because much of your uh, argument, Douglas, seems to be about the us versus them, the fact that, you know, we have our own values, our own Britishness, our own virtues, and they will come to our shores with their, their values, their traditions. You seem to almost suggest that they come to your countries with a lesser breed of values. No, I don't think I said that at any point, and that's another time you've tried to put something in my well, mouth. Um, so when you talk about the difference the in list. values, what do you suggest? Um, look, uh, uh, first of all, I didn't say that. I said that there are challenges, because we do know that there are challenges, and let, let's, let's just be frank about this. I mean, for instance, I, I've been in, in the Gulf for uh, the last week or so. Uh, I, I've, I see more burqas in my home city of London than I have seen in the Gulf in recent days, certainly here in Doha. Now, I can't say I'm delighted by the, the, the sight of more and more burqas in London. Uh, do, do I feel any hatred of the people who wear them? Of course not. Of course not. But I, I can't say I'm elated by it. And definitely there are times I think, you know, what percentage of burqas in this area becomes like not that pleasant for everyone else. But again, is it all down to burqas? Because again, you're not asking people uh, with other traditions whether they care about the sight of people drinking alcohol well, or, or well, showing well, up in well, bikinis. You, well, again, well, it's a well, very we could, we could Western-centric viewpoint. I'm, I'm not, I have to say, you're, you're going to bark up the wrong tree if you think you're going to persuade a Brit that we should stop drinking alcohol because of people arriving in our country. I mean, that's not going to happen. The, these things well, are all a bit of give and take. You bring your but, own but, traditions that don't quite fit with theirs. Well, they don't. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are, as I said, and before 
before we got all confrontational, which you did from the get-go, I said, what the problem is here is that these things are all rubbing against each other. And in that situation, you have to work out what things you're willing to give up, which things you're willing to compromise on, and which ones you're not. You're not going to persuade the Brits to massively change their culture. But let me just make the point. Every single society has certain aspects of it it doesn't want to give up. This one will in Qatar. This one will. Everyone does. So please don't which try to make this values? a kind of bigoted which of your European values? thing. Which that would be a very, very, very dishonest way to. That would be a very dishonest but, but way to represent this debate. Just answer this question directly, if you can. Which of your values are you most afraid to lose? Which ones are most threatened by oh, uh, the of arrival speech. of refugees? Freedom of speech. It's the first one. Oh, you think that's not a problem? I mean, you think uh, that's not a problem? But, but you I'll think let you sorry, take it no, on. no, no, let no, me, let me, let me it's pick it's up on that. Let me pick up on that. It's what very about the easy of to snigger. It's very easy to snigger about this until you've had friends shot in a newspaper office. It's very easy to laugh about that until it's happened to people you know. Right, but can, could you see how the, the very same discourse of anxiety or discomfort around seeing hijab could lead to the very same outcomes as yours for free speech of, of the press? In other words, the same discourse that says, well, you know, I'm a little, I, I, of course I respect your religion, but I'm uneasy when I see it performed in, in public in a certain way. That leads to violence. That leads to I a don't think that does lead to it. But I'm, 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 can I really? Let's look at the, I, look I, at the I, solutions here if so, you have so one for us. I, I, th I think we have to um, think about, so values, freedom of speech, absolutely. Um, why are we supporting, I, I agree with you, Putin and others are a problem as well. But we also, as a British citizen and somebody who's a resident in the United States and a taxpayer in both countries, um, I am frustrated by the fact that we are, you know, that we are enabling the war in Yemen and we have made billions and billions of dollars in weapon sales to, the, to those. So those, those values, if we believe in human rights, that counters those values. On the burqa question, as much as I also, especially as somebody who, in Britain, as, as our colleague over there, despite being there 40 years, I would, be, I would still be told things like, your English is good, that happens occasionally sometimes, um, which is an indication of, of, you know, you're not quite one of us type of thing. Um, and and I, would, I am Muslim by birth, so, so de by definition, I'm probably British Muslim as well. Um, I don't like to see the burqa and the niqab either, but by the same token, I look at it and I think, well, does it really bother me? What does it do to me? I don't like people in covered in tattoos either. I don't like a man in a, in a skimpy speedo on the beach either. That doesn't appeal to but, my but, but it does sense of aesthetic either. It does disrupt the social cohesion yeah. that, so, so, that Douglas so, so is talking I, it, about. There's, a le there's an element of like, we may not like it, but actually freedom of expression, freedom of expression yeah. and liberal democracy m does mean that we have to think about as long as it their human rights doesn't butt up against mine or yours. Mm. I think that is the issue. Mm. That if they start telling you right. or they start telling me, then that becomes a problem. So how do you look at this discussion? I know you don't like to be sort of dragged into anything too political, but how do you look at it? Okay, so basically it is so interesting to hear different views, but I would like to add a very important point that when I go to a different country, that doesn't mean I will impose my culture or my belief on those people. Uh, you know, everyone has uh, different things. Like I have my own faith, I have my own nationality, I have my own culture that, uh, you know, is part of my life. You know, I cannot change it because I was grown in this way. So uh, if I respect myself, if I respect my identity, I don't want to change it. But at the same time, I have to respect others. So like, for example, when I am in the UK, I saw different people with different styles, with different beliefs, with different opinions. This makes me, uh, you know, kind of uh, interested in knowing more. Like, if I will, uh, you know, in my class or in my seminars or lectures actually in the UK, if I will go to somebody and tell them, okay, you have to be a Muslim, for example. This is wrong, you know. Uh, I, I believe in something that if you live in a society that has differences, you can learn so much and you can create and uh, have so many advancements. Because if we all are similar, uh, similars, we cannot, you know, uh, have uh, deeper insights. And they believe in something as well. Uh, yeah. You know, that uh, if you 
don't want to change something part of you. No one can impose you to change it. For example, if you uh, don't wear a head scarf, for example, I cannot come to you and force you because you are convinced that you, you don't like to wear a head scarf. So I cannot go to you and tell you, no, you have to. You, no one can force you uh, on something if you don't want. Okay. So if I live in the UK or I live in Doha or I live in Syria or any part of the world, we can work, you know, cooperative work where we can create from those differences something really uh, helpful for all of us, not for individuals. And look, okay, refugees are coming to steal opportunities or refugees are coming to change, you know, specific terms in our societies. No, that doesn't happen because each person has, you know, something special. Like I have my special uh, identity and they have theirs and they have to respect them. And, and that, that, I agree with you. I think that's the kind of pluralistic vision we should have. It kind of, it's the kind of multicultural world I'd love to live in. I, I think you're right. I think the problem is oftentimes w when refugees enter spaces, particularly in the West, we see their culture as corrosive. We see the very presence of Muslims as a challenge to our identity. We see the very presence of brown people as a challenge to our national identity. And as such, we, we worry about it and, 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 and we have a collective panic about it. And I agree with you. The, the, I also don't like lots of tattoos or Speedos at the beach. But the difference is, the, the, the way that is understood as, as, as a public performance is very different than the way we understand uh, Islamicity or, or Muslimness in, in, in terms of the way we okay. frame it. In, I'm, I'm going I'm to just one second yeah. on this Islamicity and Muslimness. I think we have to be very, very careful about some of the sources of extreme fringe sort of sects of Islam that have become dominant and have become the, do the, the way the West understands Islam. Right. It is not. Most Muslim societies, at least until 20 years ago, were very synchronistic. People lived and and and, and agreed. Were. So so it I is. And, and, and it comes to the. I wasn't it, saying Islam is. I was no, saying. No, I mean, it comes to the. It comes. It comes actually to some of the geopolitics because a lot of this is unfortunately Saudi funding of mosques and so forth across the world and in England and so, and and that sort of entering into our political discourses in ways that we haven't understood. Oh, actually, and people we, saying, oh, this is Islam. Are we, it is not right, Islam. and they have an anxiety about a particular form yeah. of fundamentalist or political Islam. I agree with you. My, my only Extremist, not fundamentalist. Sorry. Sure, fair, fair point, fair point. The words matter. That's an important right. distinction to make. I concede that. I guess, I guess my point, though, is, is, is not much different. It's, it's just to say that in the West, we have a particular fear of that, and it shapes how we respond to the refugee crisis. Is there yeah. an over-exaggeration, Douglas, do you think, in the West, this fear of Islam or any Anything that looks so different to us. No, I mean, uh, the society I'm from is one of the most pluralistic and diverse societies on earth. You, you couldn't get a larger range of people of different backgrounds and ethnicities and languages than you have in Britain. And which it's is why, country. once again, if I may push back against this thing you are pushing, which is that these are sort of uniquely bigoted, un, unwelcoming societies, not at all. the evidence in, on this part of the stage would suggest that Britain is not. If for anything, instance. I'm giving you the so, chance to tell us, from your so perspective, what you find uh, threatening or not about I would, refugees I, I'd coming suggest, to England. Let me answer that by. by by broadening, if I may. My suggestion would be, if we're to arrive at any kind of common understanding on this, is that we agree that, for instance, where there are people who pretend that everyone who arrives is a terrorist is, is, is barking mad, okay? We can agree with that, but don't laugh at people with serious concerns about serious security concerns either. Because like what? Well, let me... Because... You know, we had this in 2015 when certain officials in, in Europe said the likelihood that anyone coming on the boats among the 1.5 million people who arrived in Germany are going to be violent in any way is total, you know, xenophobic fantasy. And everyone laughed until people started letting off bombs, until, like, in Ansbach in Germany, they just had a suicide bombing outside a wine bar. And it, it just stopped being quite so funny. So all I'm saying to you is, you can agree with me that people who say that most people arriving are going to be violent are ridiculous. Yes, but also don't claim it's ridiculous for people to have serious and sincere concerns about what is happening. Because if you do, there's no way anyone's going to arrive. And that is the reality. Yeah, Absolutely, Mark. How do you deal with this? It is yeah, a reality. This is, you know, it's the way a reality. people feel. No, it's a reality that people have sincere uh, and serious concerns. Sorry. It doesn't mean that the serious and sincere concerns are rational or well-founded. Um, and I understand the idea that this often comes from the extreme, but in the United States, that extreme is the White House, yes. right? So, the, I mean, Donald Trump himself has been very clear in, in 
articulating the particular danger that Syrian refugees bring, despite the fact that they're vetted, despite the fact that they spend time in resettlement centers, but despite the fact that they're actually statistically much less likely to Mark's engage in an acts of right. terror. And I can I the Brexit propaganda again, just to scare uh, right. people I, yeah, towards this, this is, Again, I, having lived uh, as a Brit living in America right now, um, my children were in a lockdown mode at school. They teach them lockdown. Right? So that in case of gun violence, your six-year-old, your 10-year-old, your 18-year-old is taught to go into the corner of the room because of gun violence. The gun violence in America, the terrorism, as we see, is not coming from Mexicans and Latinos and Syrians and Muslims. It's coming from white men, no, but, overwhelmingly. But, but, and so, so again, uh, it, and this our, is and a problem. Use of language, but, but, our but, use of language, because in most cases, it, it is a white and, man, it'll and, be a and, and the soul, second, not a And terrorist. the second thing is, if we look at Europe, to me, the problem that, that we need to understand, and it goes back to one of the comments about from one of the floor, is that it's not, it's not actually the first generation. The first generation are often the ones who do want to integrate, and they just, just want to, at least yeah. my experience, you want to keep your head down, go to school, get a job, get, get going. It is that second generation that has grown up, born and grown up, and feels a sense of unbelonging because they're not reflected at all in the education, in the history books, in the art, in the culture, and they are demonized. And that's the, that's the community we have to be well, dealing with and recognizing, Douglas, and I that's the pluralism I, that are none of our society. I know you have something to say before I go to Nanofar. We do, we do have ahead. to address that. Every society on Earth has difficulty integrating people, okay, from a very different background. Yes. It's always difficult. Again. I don't think we should fall into this idea that Europeans are uniquely bad at it. We've had to do a lot of absorbing very fast, and we've done most of it very damn well. And bits of it haven't gone well, and we've got to address that. But again, we can agree that there is gun violence in America from crazy people who think they need to be armed to walk to the supermarket. And that crazy doesn't mean... Well, OK, but that doesn't mean that people in France don't have their own specific Absolutely. security concerns Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. And Absolutely. what I'm urging you to do is, to, um, let's not look at this just from an American point of view. In Europe, it is a serious security concern we have now, and we are trying to deal with it, and that shouldn't be laughed at. Even though I should, no one should laugh at this. And, but let me just say, uh, the research shows, though, that there is no clear link between immigrants and refugees and an increased rate of crime. The research but said no, that it's quite true. the opposite in the that's United States and in Europe. That's not true. The German sure government did a research that showed quite no, the opposite no last year. No clear link, as far as I can tell. But let's go yeah. to a question, please, from the audience again. Good evening. My name is Asma, and I'm from Kenya. And my question is to you, Douglas. So you talked about people, be, um, us serving justice. And do you think it's judicious for these people in Britain? For example, you talked about how Britain is giving aid to these countries in Africa. It's judicious for them to give this much money to these countries, but without even listening to their needs. So this only contributes to the white savior complex yeah. that is currently a big issue in okay. This Africa. whole notion of, of charity as opposed wow. to policy. Well, there is, there is a saying we have, damned if you do and damned if you don't. If it's the case that if we don't give aid, we'd be accused of not giving aid, and if we do give aid, it's a white savior complex. I mean, we can all give aid better, for sure. And I just gave, in my opening remarks, what I think was a, a serious suggestion for one very good use of aid, which is to prioritize it in the region and in the neighboring countries of people, places people are fleeing from. But, I mean, as I say, I, I, if, if would refuse as well to see the multifarious problems that exist in, in your own home country and sadly across the continent of Africa. I refuse to say that that's, you know, because of foreign aid only. It's so many things. So many things have gone wrong there, and you know that better than I do. Nelofar, let's go to you, please, for um, your thoughts on what's going on online, the questions oh. that are coming through. Yeah, Rida, the, the online comments are uh, heating up just about as much as it is in the studio here, actually. Um, I've got a couple of interesting comments that have been made uh, on, on top of what Douglas has been saying, actually. So we've got one person uh, who's asking, uh, how do you integrate into a society that, due to xenophobia, undermines and undervalues your abilities? Surely the responsibility of integration is mutual. And that's a question for our uh, panelists. I've got another one here, if I can find it. Um, a question from Charles McLean, who says, I don't know if people fleeing conflict are more deserving of asylum than economic refugees. What is moral? What is fair? Rida. Thank you very much for that. I would love to get your thoughts as we wrap up. I know there's a lot of people waiting to ask questions. I'm afraid that we are slowly running out of time. Let's start with you, Sanam. Your thoughts, how, how do you pull this, this discussion together? 
first of all, I think, I think we found more common ground than, than we expected in the sense that um, I agree. I agree with, with the, cons the security concerns are real, whether they're perceived or not. But we have to be able to understand that in each context, they come from different sources. And by and large, there, it's not about the refugees. It's about other things that are going on in society. On the right, white, uh, uh, superior, the, the, the savior complex, again, just as, as, a, as a British citizen, I'm going to put this, 4.7 billion dollar pounds plus 860 million pounds of weapons sales for Yemen versus 200 million pounds just now of pledged aid. Let's not pretend that the aid that we give anywhere mirrors or matches the, the weapons and the other right. resources that we get. Moving it and, forward and just to, one to last the solutions. Point. Something um, we call, we that we call can brown enter. people migrants, we call white people who go abroad to work expats. This is really important. <laughs> right? So there is a lot of movement and a lot Again, of money being made absolutely. by people going abroad and bringing it but back. The language, the language that we use, whether this should even be, be called a global refugee crisis, given the fact that refugees have been flowing in and out of the developing world within their own region for decades. No one ever bothered calling this a refugee crisis unless it started affecting and until it started affecting Europe. And I'm not looking at you specifically, Douglas. I'm just sort of stating a fact. Uh, 30 seconds for each, please, if we can have your final thoughts. Mozun. So I would just uh, love to say that each individual can do something. You know, sometimes we think we need somebody else to come and help us, or maybe we are waiting governments to make a change for us. But I think every one of you and those who are watching and anyone in the world can participate because big impact starts with small actions. And that what happened with me as an individual who was living in refugee camps and just they had my voice and they used my voice to change the world. And that's because uh, I am Muzun now who didn't give up and once we believe in ourselves and believe that we can make a change we can make it let's make this a change in helping those people who are in need to us because they are living in difficult times and they need your help and your help can give them hope and the future thank you very much douglas murray we've been saying that governments have failed policies have failed on an individual level what can we do what will you do differently thinking about this issue Firstly, by the way, migrants versus expats, there's a very clear reason. It's expected, rightly or wrongly, that expats don't stay in the country and bring up their families and stay for generations. The assumption with migrants is, currently has been in recent generations, that they are going to stay and that Some it's going to be a multi-generational thing. That's the assumption. So but it's an interesting and important thing. Very quickly, just on the integration thing, I repeat, I think we've got to be very, very careful that we don't end up lambasting the freest and most generous countries. And I would just urge, as a call to, as it were, more moral caution on this, urge you in this room and people watching, how many people have you made uh, citizens of Qatar from Syria? How many? Okay. It's something worth thinking about, isn't it? All right. Absolutely. Mark, your thoughts? I'm, I'm, I, I'm sitting with... The, I'm still sitting with uh, Douglas's initial... Uh, distinction between justice and mercy, which I think is very helpful. Uh, and I wish we'd had more time to unpack that, not in Aristotelian mode, maybe in Socratic mode, where we could unpack the very meaning of these terms, what justice means. Because for me, I, I, yeah, we'd all agree that education is great and education provides hope. I agree with you a thousand percent. I think you might disagree on what government should pay for that or what role the government should play for a migrant. I might, we, you and I may disagree on that. We'll do that another time. That's my point. You and I may, you, 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 would, you would say that we have to have justice and mercy. I think we would all agree, but we would disagree on what justice looks like. Mm -hmm. Because for me, if you are the freest and most well-resourced nation, but you have done that by destabilizing the Middle East and, and underdeveloping Africa and exploiting uh, the, the, the rest of the global South, then you have a role to play in, in providing support and safety and freedom and self-determination for those countries that have been exploited. And for me, that's not an act of mercy. That's an act of justice. Could be, could be. Well, thank you both very much. I think for you both, it seems to boil down to a core belief that states have rights and obligations toward their own citizens, whereas you, I think, believe more than anything else that humans have rights that should prevail over the rights of states and that we should all talk about what pushes refugees to the situation that makes them become 
refugees, as we say. So for now, thank you all very much for a fantastic and fascinating discussion, which will no doubt continue. Mark Lamont Hill, Douglas Murray, Muzun al Melehan, and Sanam Naragi Andalini, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.